What's up, friends? Glad you're joining me on the Challenging Conversations show brought to you by the Edify Podcast Network. Challenging Conversations is a podcast intended to empower Christians to be bold and not afraid to jump into controversial topics with anyone on any topic, anytime. Now today, what we're going to be discussing on today's episode is one of the most controversial passages in Scripture. It's found in the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And just a few verses there, verses 11 through 15, and it has to do with this event that will take place sometime in the future called the Great White Throne Judgment. And there we are told that unbelievers will be brought forth from the dead. It'll be, it's referred to as the second resurrection. And there they will face final judgment. And those who are not in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, if you've been with us in the previous episode, we had talked about Jesus's view of hell. Did he teach it? If so, where did he teach it? What did he mean in these descriptive and the descriptive language and the imagery that he's giving. Was it just metaphorical? Was he talking about a literal place, Gehenna, and that was it, and nothing regarding hell where people go for all eternity who are separate and eternally damned from him who rejected the gospel? So hopefully you guys found that episode to be not just challenging but informative so that you can continue to engage people wholesomely and objectively and respectfully that may disagree with your position theologically and doctrinally on hell. Now today we're going to be talking about the final judgment that we're told by John the Apostle that will take place at some point in the, in the near future. And this is very controversial because number one, it presents that Jesus Christ is the King of King and Lord of Lords. And he's the one that will open up the books of life and he's the one who is just and right in his position as the Savior of the world, as the Lamb of God, who will then determine the final fate of people who rejected him and this whole concept of the lake of fire. So if you don't have a Bible handy, you could just listen while I read this particular passage so we can get some context here. It says here in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead and were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, my friends, what we're going to do is we're going to look at five different aspects of this particular passage to get better clarity with what is going on. And so to do that, the first thing that we're going to be actually looking at here in Revelation 20 is the word judgment, to understand what judgment is. See, the Bible contains the certainty of judgment. Now, I know a lot of people don't like that uh, because, again, a lot of us are told that we live by our own standards, that we follow our own heart, that we're not going to be judged, that there's not some God sitting there uh, who is in control of all things. But the reality is, when we see Scripture, that God does exist and He is the rightful judge over all creation. The word judgment appears in the Bible, catch this, over 226 times. It has always illuminated itself over the hearts and the minds and the souls of every human being. Matter of fact, if you look at the book of Hebrews, the writer there aptly warns that just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. It is not a matter of whether or not a person will be judged, but the matter of what type of judgment that person will receive. So the Christian, we know, according to Scripture in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, we know that the Christians will face what is known as the judgment seat of Christ when they die. Now see, this judgment is not concerned with one's sin. They have been atoned for. This is for Christians who will be judged, but they've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so they're going to be 
judged on account of how they served their master. So they will receive a reward that is based on their faithful stewardship as a believer. Again, you can find that in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Now, the book of Revelation, though, describes an unparalleled judgment that will take place at the great white throne immediately following the millennial reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. That's what the millennial reign actually means. So to, to dive deeper into understanding uh, what Revelation 20 is, un, is uh, you know, really speaking to, we need to go to the prophet Daniel, okay? An Old Testament book of prophecy because here is a great parallel passage. When you take John's description of the great white throne and you look at the prophetic writings of Daniel himself. Now remember, Daniel, he received this amazing count. This is found in Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. He writes, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Then thousands times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Now, unlike this account of Daniel, there are many other scriptural passages that implicitly refer to the coming great white throne judgment. Matter of fact, if you look at Luke, he records these words from Paul himself at Areopagus. This is in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. This is what Luke writes down from the teachings of, of Paul himself. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Paul told the Romans, this is in Romans chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, God will give to each person according to what he has done. And not only that, but also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, remember this is all building from what we see in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, Paul depicted the type of wrath that's going to fall upon the unbelievers, which is an insight that Daniel had thousands of years ago. Paul writes, he will punish, that is Jesus, those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. So my friends, we have Revelation 20, You have Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. You have passages about the wrath that is going to come according to Acts 17, verse 31, Romans 2, 5 and 6, and the description where Paul says to the Thessalonians that the people who rejected the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction and they'll be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Now keep that in mind because the third aspect that we have to unpack here is who's mentioned at the throne here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, where John says, Then I saw a great white throne in him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. So here we actually see insight of Jesus Christ. Now, John does not refer to the person on the throne to be Jesus. The text and many more scriptural references actually support this implication. For example, to go back to the teachings of Jesus in John chapter 5, verse 22, he said, the Father has entrusted all judgment to the Son. The great theologian, John Walverd, he comments, quote, Christ has all judgment committed to him. And it is in keeping with God's purpose that Christ should rule over Israel, according to Psalm chapter 2, verse 6, as well as over all the nations, verses 8 and 9. The concept of Christ being the judge is found frequently in Scripture. Matthew 19, verse 28, Matthew 25, verse 31, and 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, end quote. So the timing in which the great white throne takes place is 
a great indicator, my friends, of the judge being Jesus Christ. Because Walvert, I like what he says here. He says, quote, the time of this judgment will be at the end of the millennium and the beginning of the eternal state. And the judgment is related to both of these factors, end quote. So the point we have to understand when you're looking at the Great White Throne Judgment, this event that will take place sometime in, in, in the near future, and this is the final judgment. This is after we've ruled and reigned with Christ on earth. He's been restoring things with King David. This is in Zechariah chapter 12 or, uh, through chapter 14. When we see this Great White Throne, this is, this is the end of all sin. And so what Jesus is doing here that John sees is he's overseeing the final judgment of mankind. And Jesus is doing this while he's seated on his throne in space before he ushers in the new heavens and the new earth because we see that in Revelation 21 and 22. And what's also awesome about this is the splendor and the absolute perfection and holiness of Jesus' presence that can cause the earth and the sky to flee. Okay, so all evil that has wrecked his universe is going to be gone for all good, for all for all eternity. Okay, that's what's so amazing. And so as we as we look deeper into this context, we got to ask ourselves, um, well, who who is who is at this throne? So we have Jesus is on the throne, and then what we have to also understand now is we have to see the lake of fire, because notice here when 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 you have Jesus at the throne and you see that this lake of fire is here, the word throne appears some 30 times in the book of Revelation. Okay, so this is significant. Now, when John is recording here in in Revelation 20 verses 11 for uh, 15, it's actually completely different than the other thrones that have been mentioned in his book so far. See, John, he uses the word dead four times in five verses to convey a point. So we have to pay close attention to what John is saying here when it comes to the great white throne judgment, unlike the other thrones that have been mentioned previously in the book of Revelation. Now these people who stand before this great white throne are individuals who willingly reject the free gift of salvation. If you take a notice and you take a closer look at the graphic words that depict where these people come from in order to be judged. It's very clear, my friends. Matter of fact, John mentions that they come from the sea or in other language, he uses the death in Hades. You see, the Bible, my friends, emphatically states that people without Christ are, according to Ephesians 2 verse 11, dead in their trespasses in their sins. So this whole thing of the lake of fire This is a very, not just a metaphorical, but this is a very graphic demonstration of what will happen to people, not just the the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself. We're told in Matthew 25 that when Lucifer had sinned and the other angels, it was that hell was created for them. This was prior to Adam and Eve sinning. Okay, so that was where they were going to be destined to go. Instead of roaming the universe for all eternity, they'll be sent to the lake of fire. But at the final judgment here, where Jesus is sitting on the throne, he will send people to the lake of fire, not by his coerced will, but that he's respecting the free will and the choices of those who rejected him. For example, let's go back, if, if I may, to get a deeper understanding of this so we can understand what has transpired up to this point. When you go back to the life of Nicodemus in that famous passage in John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. That's verse 18 of chapter 3 of John. So according to what Jesus said, and of course he says later in verse 36, he who has a son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. So unbelievers go to a place known as Hades, which is a place we see recorded in Luke chapter 16, verses 18 through 
through 31, which I talked about in my previous podcast. There's a place of torment. And after they died, they're awaiting their final judgment. And their final judgment will take place here at the great white throne before they're cast into the lake of fire. This is repeated in Matthew 25, verse 41, Revelation 19, verse 20, Revelation 20, verse 10, and of course, Revelation 20, 14, and 15. So the lake of fire is also referred to as the lake of the burning sulfur. This is, as I mentioned earlier, where the beast, we're told, the false prophet, and Satan and his last rebellion with death and Hades, all of those whose names were not found in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is also mentioned as the second death because it is, this is important, my friends, it's referred to as the second death because it's the final judgment and the final destination of the wicked as well as the final resurrection because the first resurrection had to do with those who are righteous. This is what we see in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 and John 5, verse 29 and Acts chapter 24, verse 15. So the second death is also known as the second resurrection. And we who have died and have been raised in life in Christ, that's the, the, the eternal life that we have. And the first resurrection is when Christ comes to, rap, to rapture his church, we will receive our resurrected bodies. Okay, so just as Christ rose from the dead and was in a resurrected body, a spirit-dominated body, we will have that one day. The great theologian Dwight Pentecost refers to the second death to be the final act in the program that was enacted that God may be all in all. That's according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 28. Dwight Pentecost further writes that the second resurrection, better termed the resurrection of damnation, includes all who are raised to eternal condemnation. It is not chronology that determines who is in the second resurrection, but rather the destiny of the one raised. Why are they there? Because they rejected Jesus as Savior, which leads to the book of life now. You go from the judgments to Jesus on the throne. We talked about what the throne actually looked like. We talked about uh, the lake of fire. And now we have to understand the book of life. See, John describes in verse 12 the people who will be judged at the great white throne as great and small. Now, this is language that's actually used in Revelation 11, 18, Revelation 13, 16, and Revelation 19, 18. And what John does is he points out two different types of sources by which unbelievers will be judged. There's the reference of books and the book of life. John writes that these unbelievers were judged according to what they have done. Going back to John Wolverd, I like what he provides here because he gives some good commentary as to reason for these books. He writes, quote, those who are judged worthy of the lake of fire fail to meet the requirements of God's judgment in two respects. First, their works are not according to the will of God. Second, they do not have eternal life as witnessed by the fact that their names are not found in the book of life. Now, there are many passages of scripture that offer explanatory reasons for the books being opened at the great white throne. For example, in Romans chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, Paul teaches that men will be judged by their conscience and also their secret works. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14. Jesus also In Matthew chapter 12, 36 and 37, he professed that each person will be judged by every word they speak. And lastly, we're told in Revelation 14 verse 11, that those who receive the mark of the beast will have their name removed from the book of life and therefore will be judged and sentenced to eternal damnation in the lake of fire. So as a result, if we take these scriptures collectively, And we're seeing the book of life being opened up. Jesus himself sitting on his throne. He's the right, rightful judge, as we're told in John 5, 29. If a person is found to only have works, yet without Christ, then their names are not found in the book of life. Again, Revelation 17, verse 8. Revelation 20, verse 12 and and, and verse 15. So the ultimate consequence to not being found in the book of life is to be thrown into the lake of fire as a result, according to Matthew 25, verses 41 and 46. Going back to Pentecost to explain 
this a bit further, he writes, God's purpose of the judgments at the end of the millennium is to remove from the eternal kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. By this judgment, God's absolute sovereignty has now been manifested. So this is about God's sovereign rule and judging and removing sin completely. It would be finally removed. Though the great white throne judgment graphically portrays this reality of the second death of people coming out of where they've been placed since they've died and been put in now into the lake of fire. The truth of this matter, my friends, is they freely rejected the free gift of salvation. And that's so disturbing that this will come one day. John saw it. John saw this day when he was caught up to heaven and Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, he revealed to him this great white throne judgment. And that's why, my friends, it's so important for us to understand that this part chronologically where it is at. So whether you are professing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior right now before the rapture and then we're caught up and we're taken and those who remain will be under the rule of the Antichrist and there are going to be many people are going to come to saving faith in Jesus during that time of the tribulation. There's still hope and there's still time for people not to surrender and take the mark of the beast, but rather that people would find Jesus Christ and profess him as Lord and Savior of their life and be dwell with the Holy Spirit and, and receive everlasting life. And those people, their names will, will be in the book of life and they will not be brought from death and Hades from the sea great and small and receive the final judgment and be cast into the lake of fire where the Antichrist and Satan will be. But those people who have rejected Jesus freely have chosen to reject the free gift of salvation. So my friends, if you look at this doctrine that we're seeing about when it comes to judgment and you're trying to factor in uh, all of what this, you know, how this makes sense to your life and having these discussions with other people. These are not fear tactics. This is reality. Sin has consequences. And we're told that sin leads to death. And God who created all things perfect and gave us free will. And we have abused that gift. And as a result, we are experiencing the spiritual, physical, and eternal death and separation from him. But in his great mercy and love, as we're told in Scripture, according to 2 Timothy 1.9 and Ephesians 1.7, Jesus came to take the wrath for us and he atoned. And I know these are challenging conversations because what we're doing is we're confronting people with their sin and their rebellion against God. And yes, there's, there's a real heaven and while over 70 to 80% of people when you talk, they believe in heaven, they believe they're going to go there because they're a good person. Nobody wants to admit that they are a fallen sinful individual and their need of saving. That's pride. And pride gets in the way. But the reality is, and I admit and you admit hopefully, that Jesus is the answer. He is the way. He's the son of God. That's why his name is be Jesus for he will take his people's sins away. And so the amazing thing is when Jesus was that Passover lamb, that that wrath of God passed over us and was and fell upon the second person in the Trinity. And he became the second Adam, according to Romans 5, verse 12. And that imputation, we have become now justified by faith. And so if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I pray that you would do that today. And if you have, by listening to this podcast and you want to find more information how you can grow in your newfound faith, you can reach out to us at info at stanstrongministries.org or you can go to our website at stanstrongministries.org. If you are a Christian and you're listening to this and it's a challenging topic and it is causing you to consider how you need to be having these conversations with people around you, because listen, it's not just a matter of me saying, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want the people that God has put in my sphere of influence, I need to do a better job, my friends, to be honest, with conviction as I'm recording this with you guys and we're talking about this. That there are going to be people who are going to appear before the great white throne judgment. And their name is not in the book of life. And you got to ask yourself, what can I have done to help prevent that? Was I too shy? Was I letting cancel culture get in the way? And so when we listen to these kind of podcasts, it's not just for us to learn about what the right or wrong thing to do. This is about us 
overcoming some of our fear and overcoming apathy and ignorance and being willing it's not about going toe to toe with people, but be willing to take what the scripture teaches us, what Jesus plainly taught and what he revealed to the apostle John here in the book of Revelation and saying, okay, Lord, I know you and by your grace and, and through the, the favor of other people in my life, whether you're raised in a Christian home and you had a great mom and dad or grandparents or aunt and uncle or a great pastor, you went to a Christian school and through that you came to Christ, praise God. But let's not take that for granted. Let's help other people know that there is a heaven, but there's also a hell. And it's very clear that those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, they will spend eternity with him. And hell is a real place. And one day, the great white throne judgment will happen. And Jesus himself will open up these books. And if those people's names are not in him, they're not going to heaven. They're going to go into the lake of fire for all eternity. So as difficult and as hard sometimes it is to talk about these things, if we truly love God and his truth and love people, then we have to take the totality of what scripture teaches us and we have to apply it in our lives and allow the truth of God to transform us and to push us to have more challenging conversations. So I pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you guys as you listen to this podcast. If you guys could do me a favor as you're listening, if it's helping you grow in your faith, I would love it if you guys would go out there, whatever platform you get this podcast and leave us a review and help spread these messages to help inspire other people to have more challenging conversations. Until next time, keep having those challenging conversations.